Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything. As long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the parts of the old law which remain valid and grave today, the Ten Commandments. Today we'll begin looking at the First Commandment. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me, thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. I am the Lord thy God, mighty, jealous, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands to them that love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, 2-6 out of this passage, the points that qualify as a command are these. You shall have no strange gods before God. You shall not make a graven image to worship, adore, or serve it. These are both part of the same command, because to the ancient Israelites, they would have both meant basically the same thing. Have no other gods, and don't make gods for yourself in the shape of graven images like all the other nations in the surrounding area did. For today, though, let's look at what it means to put God before everything else, and whether we can explain this obligation using the rules of divine ethics that we outlined in episode 21. Obviously, there's only one God. This is clear not just because of the order in the universe, but because the whole idea of God depends on so many superlatives. For example, being the source and true nature of all goodness. If there's more than one God, then either neither one would be the source of all goodness, or else one would be and the other wouldn't. In that case, one would be God and the other wouldn't be. Only one being can possibly fulfill the role of being God, because you just can't have more than one supreme being. Even a trait like infinite power would be impossible for more than one being, because either one of them would have total control over the other, and therefore only one would have infinite power, or else neither would control the other, and so neither would be God. The doctrine of the Trinity resolves these problems handily, since it involves three distinct persons so completely united that no conflict between them is possible. Therefore, questions like, who would win in a fight, the Son or the Holy Spirit, can only be answered with, neither, because there could never be a fight between them. Since there's obviously only one God, we move on to the question of worship. People are supposed to reserve worship for God alone, which is why the First Commandment forbids worshipping other gods. This leaves us with two more questions. What is worship, and why are we obligated to worship God? Worship is the highest form of respect and reverence that we can show to any being. It's an acknowledgment of the superiority of the being we worship, and of the rightness of following that being's will. Here, I think that certain atheists are sometimes very close to the truth about worship when they say that it's demeaning for human beings to worship other beings. That's certainly true if you're talking about angels, demons, or worse, other human beings or animals. However, most intellectual atheists will also admit that we have an obligation to do the right thing just because it's right. And in saying this, they touch on the essence of what worship of God really is. God just is rightness, goodness, and so forth. Whenever we say, do the right thing for its own sake, you might as well be saying, do God's will just because it's God's will. However, there is one key difference between the atheist and the Christian in this area. The Christian is open to hearing God's will and finding out what the right thing to do really is. Atheists can guess at what the right thing to do is, they know what feels right to them or what seems to make the people in their life happy, but they don't have the revealed law to tell them the absolute truth about what's really right and wrong. Now, we know we have an obligation to do God's will, to do our best to do the right thing in every situation, in other words, to treat God with the highest possible respect, worship. We should also want to excel at this, to give God the highest possible form of worship, at which point the question becomes, what is the highest possible form of worship? God never made any secret about this. As far back as the time of Moses, he told the people of Israel all about temple worship and sacrifices, and now, through his holy Catholic Church, he's told us about the sacraments, another subject I'll get into later. And he didn't bring these things up just to be fun. In both the old days and in recent ages, God was giving us the chance to worship him in the way that he wanted to be worshipped. 
Worshipping God in the way that he wants to be worshipped can easily be justified as a moral obligation, not only because we should be putting God's will first in our lives, since he is goodness itself, but because if we don't treat God the way he wants or deserves to be treated, how can we claim that God should treat us in the way that we want or deserve? Failing to worship God properly, in other words, turns religion into hypocrisy. Of course, that's not all the first commandment has to say. Next week we'll touch on a big sticking point in this commandment, images, idols, and you. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.